human sexual attraction is a chemical process. And it makes you lust and want someone. Mate selection is one of the biggest impacts in your life. There's a lot of anxiety around searching for a partner. Loneliness can actually kill us. The leading cause of death is suicide. Why is it that when somebody breaks up with you, you feel like you're gonna die? Because in evolutionary history, you were going to die. Can you get the same benefits from these, let's call them alternative relationships? 10 hours of cuddling? That's a lot of cuddling. It's like you're on a date, but with your cat. People immediately think it's all about sex, but Tantra is so much more than that. <laughs> we all want to stay young forever. There's an entire industry that has talked into being dissatisfied with ourselves. But we live in a world full of noise. Celebrity diets and detox. Of science versus pop culture. <sighs> I'm here to change that. I reach over and touch her? Yes. I uh, just want to make sure it's the right woman. <laughs> it's the right woman. <laughs> I'm Keith. I'm Terry, and uh, we've been together for 11 years. I'm Ben. I'm Eric. And we've been together for about four years now. We were married in 69, so we've been close to 50 years. Relationships are an integral part of what it means to be human. We've been married for, uh, I think it's eight years. I knew I always wanted to get married, like since I was a kid. Obviously, I thought that would be to a man. <laughs> Let's talk sex and relationships. Relationships are the greatest predictor of our overall health and wellness. And so I think people are starting to really take the study of relationships seriously. A solid connection to other people, it's as big of a risk factor for your health as smoking and obesity are. There's countless health benefits to being in a long-term relationship. And it's proven that married men live longer than single men if you're with a partner. They're taking care of you. Social relations matter. A 2010 study of over 150 different studies found that good social relationships have a significant impact on our health. But let's start with the basics. What is a relationship? A relationship is when you feel like you have a stable bond, when you know somebody else is gonna be there for you, when you have regular contact with that person, and having a sense that that person cares about you. Just being around another person isn't enough. It's having that sense that that person takes your welfare to heart. Relationships are not just romantic. Like their friendships, their family, their community, these are all of the things that are supportive, that lift us up, that have us feeling connected, that have us feeling purposeful. Right? That's what's important. Where does this need for a social relationship, for a social connection, come from? More so than most other animals, we are born into the world vulnerable, weak, and in need of physical and emotional nurturing. Our early relationships are crucial to our survival. Do you think there's this evolutionary predisposition for this tendency? I mean, it makes evolutionary sense. We're communal animals. Evolution moves really slowly, and our emotional systems we inherited from ancestors who lived thousands and thousands of years ago, and they lived in very different conditions than we did. And we think of ourselves as humans as the peak of evolution, but we're not particularly tough on our own. The biggest advantage that we have is our connection to other people. It helps you if you need to get food. It helps you uh, find where water is. You need to sleep sometimes, and you're vulnerable to predators when you do. If you have other people around, there's people who can protect you. In evolutionary times, connection to other people was literally a life or death matter. And that's what got programmed into our emotional systems. Why is it that when somebody breaks up with you, you feel like you're gonna die? Because in evolutionary history, you were going to die. That's actually the message that your emotional system is trying to send you, is that you need to make social connection your number one priority because this is vital to you being able to survive. Social connections, of course, they can come in many forms. You've got your family connections, you've got your work connections, and, and even connections on, on social media. Those things are, are real. But romantic intimacy has historically been more revered. It has been given more importance. 
You know, romantic relationships, I tend to think of them as the highest stakes relationships. You've got the most to gain and the most to lose. Falling in love, it's a norepinephrine, serotonin, dopamine. And you're getting these intense spikes that make you feel like you can do anything. You don't need to sleep. You have all this confidence. You experience pleasure more intensely. There's the sexual component, but there's also these really high degrees of intimacy. You're sort of literally and metaphorically laying yourself bare in front of another person. Having that support, having partnerships with whom we can rely, those are the things that actually propel us forward. In addition to all that research that has told us that good relationships are good for you, there's also evidence that social isolation, you know, loneliness, can also be toxic. One study involving more than 300,000 people found that individuals that have strong relationships have a 50% greater likelihood of survival compared to those with poor relationships. Loneliness can actually kill us. We've seen a study that shows that loneliness is one of the things that predicts shorter lifespans and we will be living unhealthier lives. So we want to be doing everything we possibly can to create connection and the relationships around us to prevent loneliness from happening. Some people have suggested that we're in the middle of a loneliness epidemic. There's an increasing body of evidence to suggest that this is a real problem. In the US, studies have found that over 40 million over the age of 45, suffer from chronic loneliness. In the UK, it has gotten so bad that they've appointed a minister of loneliness to deal with the problem. Japan, for example, finds itself at a watershed moment. There are less young people coupling up. Instead, they're opting to live alone. So where does this leave us? We know that sex and positive relationships improve our health, but here we are in the middle of a loneliness epidemic. What created this situation and what can we do about it? So we met because we used to work together. I was Giselle's boss. We had to hide that, of course. Yeah. We met in a chemistry lab, actually. And he was uh, in a white lab coat. It, it showed off his, his uh, complexion and his lovely hair, which was abundant and black at the time. We met first day of English class in university. He did the classic walk in 15 minutes late, and I thought, oh my God, like this guy is gorgeous. I am going to kiss him and make him my boyfriend. I was then still two inches shorter than she was. <laughs> I'll take the sexy white lab coat any time. There are many cliches in a classic love story. Love at first sight, soulmates, opposites attract, but in real life, things are often very different. The science of attraction. Look, how we're attracted to people, really, really complicated. Hormones, pheromones, neurochemicals, our animal instincts and biological impulses can take the logic out of mate selection. We certainly know that when you're first falling in lust with somebody, that basically the neurochemicals that are getting released, it's like taking a bit of a hit of cocaine, right? So that initial rush of connecting and the passion that comes from that, uh, it's a little bit like being a cocaine addict. There's an argument to be made that we're literally addicted to each other. At its barest form, human sexual attraction is a chemical process. We've got testosterone and estrogen, regardless of gender, and it makes you lust and want someone. Attraction is animalistic or innate, and attraction can also be cultural or prescribed. And I think that these two types of attraction are often at odds with one another. It's natural to feel proud to have someone on your arm who is culturally lusted after. But those of us who are able to really tap in to the animal side, we have more exciting sex, we have more intense desire and attraction, and ultimately I think we're more fulfilled because we go after what we want, not what we're told we should want. Our biological impulses aren't the only thing driving this need to find someone. Is there increasing pressure on people to find that meaningful relationship? We've been given that pressure from the get-go from society, from our families. You know, when are you getting married? What, why are you still single? There's a lot of anxiety around searching for a partner. When you look at pop culture and you're looking at Instagram and you're seeing this beautiful person, 
or couples, that often plays a role into who somebody wants to be with. The social media, you know, Instagram, Facebook, it creates this social comparison. Social conditioning and biological instincts create a huge amount of pressure to find someone. But how do we do it? I've been a matchmaker since 1992. This is pre-match.com, pre-social media, pre-Google, and I've probably had 65,000 conversations with singles all over the world. Do you think this modern world of social media shortens the time span that people are willing to put into a relationship? You know, if this isn't working by date two, I'm out of here. I think if, if it's not working with an instant connection, they sometimes make that quick of a decision. And sometimes, especially on date one, where the people are the most nervous, that's a terrible time to make a decision about a life partner. I met my wife, who I have been with for almost 30 years, the old school way, you know, no technology involved at all. I often wonder what would have happened if I lived in the era of online dating. But I think that we evolve. How we met people 150 years ago is different than how we met now. You know, we'd just be in a tiny little village and we'd be stuck with whoever was in our village. We're evolving how we communicate, how we interact, how we live, so how we meet people is gonna change. Nothing has reshaped modern romance like online dating. And the social implications of this phenomenon are just now starting to be studied. So is matchmaking still needed in this age of, of Tinder? Well, I would argue that it's needed more than ever. Mate selection is one of the biggest impacts in your life. What percentage of people now meet through an app or through a website or, or some kind of algorithm? It's 30% of all relationships now are coming from online dating apps. In today's society, meeting online is commonplace. And, and online doesn't necessarily mean a dating app. It could be social media. It could be Facebook. Less people are meeting in person. I don't recall the last time I heard a friend say that they met somebody at a bar or a church. Traditional now is digital dating. This is a big social phenomenon. Think about it. Tinder, one of the most popular apps, has over 50 million users. And every single day, there are 12 million matches. But there are also apps out there for real niche stuff. You've got things like gluten-free singles, you've got diaper mates, and there is even AmishDating.com. How the Amish find this, because they avoid technology, I'm not sure, but there you go. Technology can be a real help, and it can be a real help for particular types of peoples. When you're in your 40s and 50s, a lot of the people around you are taken. You know, I saw one statistic recently where 60% of same-sex couples had met online. And with same-sex attracted people, it's exactly the same thing. In a lot of environments, you're not surrounded by people that you're actually interested in yourself. So I think that the best way that technology can help people is by facilitating those kinds of introductions that wouldn't be possible without that kind of technology. We're not just talking millennials anymore, no. right? We're talking 50, 60, 70. There are people in this mature generation that are struggling to connect in person. There aren't bars specific to that age group. And most people assume that when you're at a certain age that you're already paired or that you're not interested. Some people have suggested that we're even perhaps in the middle of a loneliness epidemic. With so many people on dating sites, why aren't we all just paired up? It is a little bit of a paradox, right? Where you have this new way to connect with people, but at the same time, this technology provides an opportunity to be more superficial. It's a platform that allows for something that is very surface level. We often see people who are you know, having six or seven dates a week. They are constantly swiping. The story around it is there's always going to be something better. This paradox of choice is major, huge constraint for us as a society because if you are telling yourself that there's gonna be something better if I just swipe a few more times, you know, you're gonna get really stuck and caught up in that space. Is, is that because people feel like, you know, I've got this machine that will allow me to look for someone else. So if this date's yeah. going just okay, I'm giving it a six out of 10, mm -hmm. there might be a seven around the corner. Yeah, there's a seven, there's an eight, there's a nine, there's a 10. And we don't even know what that means for each person, but I'm not committed to giving you an opportunity to connect with me and me to connect with you. It's invulnerability at its greatest.
Do you think this trend, this evolution, the, you know, the technology has made things better or worse? For some people, it's so much better because the connectivity is instant. You could be on a date in a matter of minutes. The downside to that is the overwhelm, the unique challenges presented when you have too many options and you can't decide and you become commitment phobic or you keep thinking that there's always something bigger and better along the way. You know, I just did a poll of my Instagram following. I asked if dating apps make them feel uh, more connected or lonely and isolated. And the majority, I mean, I think it was about 88% said isolated and lonely. These are apps that are trying to connect people. And I do think that it obviously does work for some, but overwhelmingly, people are left feeling isolated and lonely. We have infinite potential to connect with people, more so than ever before. But the same technologies that make connecting possible are also isolating us. So what effect will this have on us as we move forward? The way that the movie goes is like you fall in love, there's some banal obstacle. You overcome that obstacle, and then the movie ends. And for us relationship scientists, that's the point where we start to get interested. That's where the work of bringing two complex people together and managing things in a way that if you want to have a relationship that lasts 50 years, there's a lot of work that's involved in that. The Harvard study of adult development has followed 268 men since they were teenagers in 1938. Only 19 of the original participants still remain, now well into their 90s. Using brain scans, blood samples, and interviews over a course of 80 years, the data demonstrates that social connections are not only good for our current health, but also fundamental to our future health. The quality of our relationships is the greatest predictor of the overall quality of our lives. The quality of our relationships at 50 predicts the quality of our health at 80. So the quality of our relationships is something that we need to be paying attention to. When it goes really well, it can be incredibly validating, it can be incredibly rewarding. And being in a happy, romantic relationship does make people feel better and does provide them with health advantages. We always have somebody to talk to and argue with and check out ideas you have, but there's always somebody there. And you kind of just make life easier for each other, right? Like I come home yeah. from work, it's been a long day, and like you're someone that you love has made you like a delicious dinner, and you're like, oh, you know, the world's not that bad, yeah. you know? Having someone that you can really share who you are with and being pushed to be your best, you're both able to attain a higher level of, of success, a higher level of uh, ability than either one of you could on your own. A key distinction between romantic relationships and other social connections, of course, it's, it's intimacy, it's trust, it's the birds and the bees. There are many interesting claims about the importance of sex to our health. While the relevant science can seem a bit iffy at times, sex has been credited with everything from fighting the flu, to boosting fertility, to increasing your attractiveness, to smoothing wrinkles, to even preventing heart attacks, lowering blood pressure, banishing depression. It goes on and on. So let's talk sex. Sex is one of the areas that can really strengthen intimacy and closeness. The act of sex is something that can create a lot of positive thoughts, connections, what's going on in the brain activity or is really good for your health. It's not about doing the sex, it's often about the quality of sex and the corollary benefits. So you feel closer to your partner, you might feel like you can be more open with your partner, you might feel as though you can be more vulnerable emotionally with your partner. But what's intimacy? Intimacy means innermost, right? So it's really about going inside and learning about ourselves. So when we bring the relationship into it, it's speaking and sharing with another, your darkest, deepest shadow parts. Um, and it's also receiving that, being the listener in that space too. Historically, Tantra was associated with a wide range of spiritual topics in both Hinduism and Buddhism. Though in popular culture, it has become better known for its eroticism. Tantra is a philosophy focused on divine energy and enlightenment that seeks to use the body as a spiritual tool to achieve transcendence. It really involves you getting really grounded with who you are 
You connect to your senses, yourself, your energy. And when you live a tantric lifestyle, then you're really aware of everything. And it's almost as if everything is alive around you. Now imagine taking that experience and moving it into eating, moving it into connecting with another person, moving it into your sex. That's the essence of Tantra. What are some of the myths that drive you nuts about in Tantra? Whenever I mention Tantra, they just immediately go to, you know, Sting was doing it for nine hours. People immediately think it's all about sex, but Tantra is so much more than that. It does involve emotional intelligence. It involves a willingness to be vulnerable and being able to talk about what you want. The sex is the enlightenment part. Our spiritual health is connected to our physical health. So when you can relate all of those together, then at a cellular level, your body is getting younger. Do you think that, that the current pop culture, a relationship industry creates these unrealistic expectations about relationships, but also about sex, about what it looks like and how it's supposed to play out. Absolutely, totally. The way it's sold out there, there's no real deep connection with another person. And I think that as human beings, we actually strive for that. We really want that. That's how we feel important and special. And people without a raised level of consciousness have no idea. They're completely unaware of what they could be having. The problem with sex is that we, we don't investigate, we don't think about what we want, we accept cultural norms without question. You know, if you go by what you see on television, you would think that nobody ever uses lubricant. But in fact, we know that, you know, two thirds to three quarters of people prefer to have lubricant when they're having sex. I think that's part of the problem is the more that we see these images, the more women and men are getting messages that are not correct about how people really have sex. The way that we often maybe write about sex or portray it in movies and television, makes it almost a bit like it's a, a competitive sport, I guess. That if you're having this many orgasms or hanging from this many chandeliers, or that somehow you're doing it right. And different people have different needs. And so there may be people who only need to have sex infrequently in a relationship to keep close. And there are other people who need to have sex a lot in a relationship to keep close. So I think that we have to remember that there's just a big spectrum. When we're talking about sex in the context of health and wellness, what really matters? Is it quantity or is it quality? Sexual quality obviously matters. There's no sense in having sex if you're not enjoying yourself or not reaping some sort of intimate reward, but quantity matters as well. What's most important when it comes to quantity, frequency, is that you talk about it. Sex is one of those things that you're allowed to do. You're allowed to depict. We see it in all of our popular media, but somehow we are still not allowed to talk about it. You can be happy with your sex life having sex every single day. Another person might be happy with their sex life having sex once a year. And that's okay, you just have to communicate with your partner. Compatibility isn't about similitude, it's about being willing to put in a similar amount of effort in order to make a relationship work. To some degree, it seems that it is the intention behind sex that shapes the role it has in our health and well-being. No two relationships are alike, but when it comes to what makes a good partnership we see many reoccurring themes, trust, intimacy, empathy, vulnerability, respect, commitment. These seem to be some of the key qualities that also encourage us to be our best, to take care of ourselves, the elements that make good relationships good for our health. In addition to all of the research that suggests that, that good relationships are good for us, there's also a building body of evidence that says that social isolation, loneliness, is a significant mortality risk. One recent study found that isolation increases the risk of heart disease by 29% and stroke by 32%. There's one place where we can witness firsthand the impact of loneliness. Japan is in a state of crisis. It has one of the world's highest life expectancies and one of the lowest birth rates. The country faces tremendous economic challenges. The workforce is aging, and there's not enough youth to take its place. By 2060, the number of people aged 14 or younger is forecast to fall by more than half 
and the population could shrink by almost 40 million, with almost 40% of the population being over 65 years old. Japan is a country that is among the world leaders in many areas, including health, technology, and education. But unfortunately, they also lead in loneliness. In Japan, we are having a relationship crisis with the younger generation. People in their 20s especially are not dating, and that definitely has psychological, emotional outcomes that are not so positive. Now, I heard this stat, and I don't, I don't know if, it, if it's true, but less than 50% of Japanese have had sex in the last month. Is that true? Yes, that is true. Um, so not a lot of sex happening here. Uh, particularly in the younger generation. I would say the older generation, your 70-year-old mom probably has more sex than you if you're 20. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It seems crazy to me that, yeah. that people aren't dating. I mean, what, what's driving yeah. that? It's very complicated. There's no one answer. The current generation, they are in a very different economic situation than their older generation. Without economic freedom, you kind of tend to move in smaller circles. And that might mean less and less frequent contact with other people. So what about you know, you have dating apps, you've got Tinder, you know, swipe left, swipe right. Right. None of that is increasing the sexual activity, increasing the relationships? I would say that dating that happens online or through social network, that is more of a Western phenomenon. In Japan, online dating has always been kind of frowned upon. It's very hard to trust somebody that you can't meet in person. It just never took off. You know, I think that this is the outcome of several decades of going after the money goal. From the ashes of World War II, in just three decades, Japan shot up to become the second largest economy in the world. And that was completely unprecedented economic miracle. What happens when, for generations, that's what you aim towards? Well, we have the consequences in our younger generation where you don't have life energy almost to engage with another human being because yes, that takes a lot of work and that takes a lot of health, you know, and confidence and concern for the other person. And it's easier, so much easier if, to just stay in your own shell. You won't be hurt, but you also won't have relationships. There's a term for this social withdrawal, hikikomori. It means pulling inward and is often used to refer to a generation of reclusive young adults who are withdrawing from social life and seeking extreme degrees of isolation and confinement. It's not so much all these people are really wanting to have sex and they can, or really wanting partners and they cannot obtain them. It's more about do they even want it in the first place. They're just not interested. Hey, relationships are hard, relationships are messy, your computer's easy. That's right, that's exactly right, and you can always turn it off. In a world with declining social connection, it's no surprise there is a growing industry built around substitutions for human intimacy. Animal cafes are a popular trend in urban centers around the world. The high cost of living, small apartments with strict pet regulations, a lack of social contact, have attracted people to cafes where they're able to interact with the furry friend. えっと、猫it's interesting that we kind of replace our significant others in a way, and it feels very much like you're on a date, but with your cat. With <laughs> the cat. <laughs> yeah. These cafes are one of the most visible examples of a growing industry built around mitigating feelings of isolation and loneliness. But cat cafes are just the tip of the iceberg. Cuddle services are popping up in major cities around the world, from New York to Toronto to Tokyo. It's interesting how people crave intimacy 
think it really highlights how it's important to our health to being a human. So, this is it. Yep, but you know, stress that that it took a day, it took each one. あのストレスだなと思うのって結局人間関係だったりすると僕は思うんですけどもでもそのストレスを軽減したり逆に幸福ホルモンっていうのを出せるのもやっぱり対人間だと思いますので僕はそうだと思います。What's the importance of human touch? そうですね、まあ、ハグ、まあ、肌に触れることで,、えーとですね、ホルモンバランス要はあの女性特有のですねえー、とベータエンドルフィン、まあ、幸福フェロモンと呼ばれているものが出てあの一説によ,るよりますと,よりますと、まあ、3秒のハグであの、まあ、ストレスが 10% 以上、まあ、軽減できると言われてます。オクシトーシン、often called the cuddle hormone, is a neuropeptide that can be released by human touch and social bonding. People crave the human touch. And we have the cuddle cafes where you can go and lie down next to somebody who will. Basically, do nothing but just lie there next to you. It's the warmth of another human being that people are missing the most. How long does a typical session last? I think, well, it's a very good thing. 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 It's a v e あのまあ全部10時間、まあ、さっきも言ったんですけども10時間全部添い寝、まあ、最初にまあいきなり添い寝っていうのもなんか抵抗あるまあ女性もいますので、まあ、最初にまあ2人で映画を見たりだとかご飯を作ったりだとかしてでそ,そこから一緒に寝たりしますので、まあいきまあ、それでまあ時間を取ったりとかしますね。Here we are in Japan. People absolutely everywhere, but they're still lonely. There are some very serious consequences associated with this cultural phenomenon. Absolutely. I mean, right now, the leading cause of death for men in their 20s through 30s is suicide. And that says a lot about the mental, emotional, and psychological state that、uh, our younger generation is in, that they would have to take their own lives. What we prioritize as a society has to shift from being. In economic prowess, to one that cherishes interrelationships、um, and interdependency. So it would definitely be a cultural shift. Japan is an example of a growing trend around the world. According to a recent study, over 40 million Americans over age 45 are estimated to be suffering from chronic loneliness. And that data might be skewed because loneliness can be difficult to admit. The emerging research around the health impacts of loneliness highlight how seriously we should be taking the issue. We've talked about how sex brings intimacy to relationships and, and how it can provide a boost to your overall well being. But what about other forms of sexual experience? There are more and more artificial options for finding a connection. There are, of course, no surprise here. A growing number of sex toys and sex products out there. But does a synthetic connection provide the same health benefits as a traditional romance? The nature of relationships is evolving, and there are all these other kinds of relationships, some of them virtual. Can you get the same benefits from these, let's call them alternative relationships? I think that we like to think that we can bend technology to our will, but again, I mean, we're fighting thousands or millions of years of evolution where what relationships meant was being directly connected to people. What makes you feel more cared for? An emoji or a hug? Our bodies are built to respond to the hug. We're not built to respond to emojis. Those are symbols of connection, right? But we're physical creatures. And I think one of the best ways that we communicate our affection to each other are through those ancient physical rituals. Sex tech aims to enhance and expand human sexuality. This rapidly growing industry is estimated to soon be worth $29 billion globally. As technology improves and sex tech becomes more sophisticated, virtual reality porn and love dolls are nudging into the mainstream. 
We're seeing a great deal more research in robotic sex, in simulated sex, in brothels where you can go rent a sex doll for an hour. And I think people scoff at it and laugh, but it's a really interesting area of research because not everybody has access to sex when they want sex. <laughs> Holy cow. These are dolls from a love doll delivery service. The clients are about 80% married men. Excuse me. Love dolls, I think, have been somewhat normalized. You're starting to see them depicted on TV. There have been um, art exhibits. Barcelona just opened the first sex doll brothel, where patrons rent a room and a doll by the hour. China's love doll industry is rapidly growing. Some have suggested that this is in response to the gender disparity caused by the one-child policy. In mainland China, men currently outnumber women by 32.7 million. It's becoming an interesting dimension of sexuality, of relationships, and maybe even love. It's heavy. It's got human weight to it. And I especially find their eyes so real that, man, you look real. Now, in terms of the outcomes, whether it's health benefits or relational benefits, a doll is probably not going to produce the same benefits because one of the advantages of being in an intimate relationship, whether you're having sex or not, is more social support. And we know that if you want to live longer, your social supports matter. Sex tech isn't limited to solo adventures. There are also products on the market designed to enhance the sexual experience of couples. We've been using technology in our sex lives for thousands of years. In fact, condoms are a great example of how technology has impacted our sex life. These devices are responsible for saving countless lives by reducing the spread of infectious disease. And contraceptives have given us more control and choice over our sex lives. But there are also thousands of products that are being sold to us with the goal of making sex better. So they're creating toys, for instance, where I can put a sleeve on, you can have a matching toy with you, and as we move, I can feel your movements through VR technology. People wearing toys may be able to experience the feeling of a sexual connection without an actual physical connection. In the end, this has the opportunity to bring people together in different ways. I think technology is a positive thing for relationships. Many of these products do, in fact, work, and they do change lives. Oftentimes, it has to do with just helping people to gain the confidence they need to engage in the activities that work for them. There's a number of apps for couples that you can use to be playful, to learn to flirt, to send stickers, to send voice notes. So overall, I think we're moving in a positive direction. But there are thousands of enhancements in the sexual health and sexual enhancement market. Some of them are a total hoax. A lot of crazy products out there, Jen. You know, people pushing things to improve your sex life, to improve your orgasm. Give me a couple examples of things that are driving you nuts right now. Well, certainly this idea that injecting platelet-rich plasma to the clitoris and the vaginal tissue, and trademarked as the O-shot, that's something that does drive me a little bit batty. This is a shot into vaginal tissue? The idea is that maybe it increases blood flow to enhance genital tissues. And of course, there's, there's no data to show that it does that. There's really no data at all to say it does anything. Jade eggs are sold, I guess, as Kegel weights. The recommendation was that women walk around with it all day inside. And that's not how your pelvic floor works, and that would actually be harmful. It plays to people's anxiety about sex. Sex is an important part of our lives, but it is the meaning and intention of the sex that brings us happiness. While enhancement devices and technology may play a bigger role in the future, it's the connection between you and your partner that ultimately matters the most. The tremendous influence of relationships and sex on our health is just beginning to be understood. It seems completely intuitive that relationships are incredibly important to society, but also to individual happiness. You know, you don't smoke, you exercise, eat good food, you sleep, and you have good relationships. I'd put it in that Venn diagram. Would you agree with that? I mean, the data are just consistent. 
along with managing your exercise, along with managing your diet, you really need to be paying attention to your relational and emotional health, absolutely. I travel a lot for work, and just as it's difficult to maintain your health on the road, it can be hard to stay connected with our loved ones. Technology can help reduce barriers, but it can't be a replacement for connection. We make time to go to the gym, we make time to eat healthy. It's just as important to make time for our relationships. I just went and spoke to 11th graders about relationships and vulnerability and their hookup culture versus long committed relationships. And overwhelmingly, the message that we heard in those classes was that their parents were telling them that they needed to stay focused on education and sports, and that's it. This message that you can't have a relationship because that's going to detract from you doing well in other areas of life is a disservice, in my opinion. These kids were sharing how frightened they are about getting into relationships, and it does create and grow that hookup culture because that's less of a distraction. I just hook up and then I move on. That's a really you know, fascinating point, mm -hmm. and, and maybe we need to start right there, mm -hmm. educating kids about how important relationships are. If we want our kids to have successful relationships as an adult, we need to give them the tools in childhood. Family is really where it all starts. We do need people sending messages that support and show the value of cultivating relationships and deepening them and committing to that space. You know, whether it's just friendships or community, even at an early age, you know, that is something that needs to be nailed home because that's going to shift the way we as adults start interacting with others. Is there hope in the future for love, for relationships, and for sex? here in Japan? I believe there is hope. I believe that as many of the young people that we see kind of shy away from relationships and take to this apathetic notion of life, I also see different kind of new dynamic movements happening. They're marginal right now, but I think that they could come to the fore if given the right support. Analog sex. That's right. <laughs> That's right. We need to acknowledge the importance of relationships not only for the young, but for the older generations too. You must get this question a lot from couples. How do you keep the spark alive? Yeah, people are so fascinated by desire in long lasting relationships. Does desire just leave us the second we get married to someone or commit to them for the rest of our lives? And one of the things that we can do to keep desire alive is do things with each other, new things with each other. That is something that can really help keep desire uh, going. Whether it's a new date, a new experience, traveling to a different country or city, whatever it might be, a new experience is something that creates that adventure and spontaneity. If you can dig in and find where your playfulness is and dance around the kitchen, be goofy, all of that, that's something that will continue the spark. One thing I always talk about my oldest patients, even my patients over 100, is that having sexual desires is normal. And just because you age doesn't mean you become asexual. Some people will say that sex is even better in their 60s than it was in their 20s. A lot of women will, re will report that around the age of 45 plus, sex starts to get better because we become more comfortable with our bodies. And we, I think, become more confident asking what we want. So if there's one thing I think people could shift today in terms of having better sex, it's to ask for what you want. When you're a better communicator, the sex is better. It's important to emphasize our relationships, even 29 years deep. We make it a priority to have our own social events with each other, going on date nights, going on trips. Just making time to spend with one another. Yeah. I believe the first thing you have to do is love, really love. If you love each other, then it will go through. But I think you have to enjoy life itself in order to enjoy the relationship you're in. The key to a, a healthy, a good relationship is to be honest, even if it's sometimes very ugly. And communicating that honesty is, is paramount to a successful relationship. I really think the, the magic ingredient to us staying together was definitely creating space apart and still living our lives separately. You can kind of grow as a person. 
and be the best person you need to be. One day, we write a book and become bestseller. <laughs>